All right, well, we're ready to get started now. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 12 is what we're going to be reading uh, this morning out of Matthew chapter 12. And I'm going to read verses 22 through 32. And then I'm going to read verses 43 through 45. All right, so let's start in Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 22. I'm reading out of the King James Version of the Bible this morning. It says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Now, I want you to know that I noticed a little bit of a slight variation this time when I was studying this that I had never noticed before. And I believe that it does make a little bit of a difference on the on the idea of what's going on here. The King James Version translate this translates this word as Beelzebub, which means Lord of the Flies. And it's one of the names of Satan. But the other translations translated as Beelzebul, and that's what it actually says in the Greek, which means Lord of the house. So I just want to make that point to you because I'm talking to you about house houses this morning in a sense. And the title of my message is The Door is Unlocked and You Can Leave. All right. And so it's Beelzebul, the prince of the devils. And uh, let's see here. Uh, make sure I'm on the whip first. I'm on 25. Uh, and Beelzebul, Beelzebul, the prince of the devils, and Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebul cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come up unto you. Or else, how can, you, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods? You know what the word spoil means. Some people are older and you may not know what the word spoil means. It doesn't mean spoiled food. It means like... And this is another weird word, but booty, a pirate's booty. It's like a treasure. Okay, it's like the goods. I know. And the kids used to laugh at the snacks we had. But, but, it, but, but it means it's like a treasure. It's like the, the artifacts. It's like when you destroy a kingdom and they take off running all their silver chalices, all their chests full of golden coins, all of their food, all of their horses, all of their livestock just right there for you to get to take it. Does that make sense? And so that's what a conquering king would do when he conquered another nation. He would just take and gather up all the spoil that was left over and he would take it for his own kingdom and his own and his own purposes. Okay. So verse 29 again, because it's important, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. He that is not with me is against me and he that gathers not with me scatters abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. You know, um, just real quick, because people oftentimes wonder, well, what is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? You know, there was somebody on TikTok a while back or some social media that was trying to get teenagers to say that they they were saying, I blaspheme the Holy Spirit in whatever the case. And I got to tell you that that's not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, according to this text, is whenever someone is operating in the spirit of God and you accuse them of operating in the spirit of the devil. It's a very serious thing, right? And at the same time, I know that it's going on in the church. I know it is. 
but we have to be careful of who we accuse of these kinds of things, right? We need to we need to focus on Jesus Christ and what He's doing. But I can promise you, there are people that are in the church that are operating under the anointing of demonic spirits and not under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we need discernment in these days that yes. we live in, because the Lord has warned us in His Word that in those last days that there were going to be signs and wonders that were going to cause deception. As a matter of fact, the man of sin himself is going to operate in signs and wonders, and in a generation hungry to see signs and wonders more than they seem to be, huh? seem to be, according to Pastor Matt's understanding, seem to be more hungry to see signs and wonders than the King of Kings yeah. and the Lord of Lords rule and reign in their hearts. Yes, that's, yeah. that's, that's building an environment that we need to be careful yes. to. We need to be aware. We need to be on guard for these things. All right. He says, and whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world or in the world to come. Going over to verse 43, it says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest, and he finds none. Then he says, I will return into my house from where I came out. And when he has come, he finds it empty and swept and garnished. So a big part of what Jesus is talking about in this passage of Scripture uh, has, he, he, the word house is either inferred or directly utilized six different times in the passages that I read to you. The word house. Uh, it's inferred in the name Beelzebul in the sense that he is, his name means the Lord of the house. And we can see where the text is directly related to the fact that a demon spirit was using this man's vessel as a house. I'm not preaching on... Really, I'm not preaching on demonic spirits this morning. I'm not preaching on casting out demonic spirits this morning. I'm really preaching to you about houses. But the context or the concept is within this passage of Scripture. So the word house is utilized on more than one occasion. And in the, the life of this man, the devil was using his body as a house. And it also talks about the strong man's house. And in the context of the story, the strong man is Satan. And we'll get into that in a moment. But I want you to know that there's other places in the New Testament, specifically the book of Jude, where it talks about angels and how angels left their first, they left their habitation. And that the word for house in the Greek, and I'm not trying to get overly technical, but is oikos, O-I-K-O-X, means house in the Greek language. And in that Jude passage where it says that those angels left their habitation, it's talking about how you do understand that in according to the book of Genesis in chapter 6, this isn't really my message, but the Bible says fallen angels cohabited with the daughters of men and somehow they created a hybrid offspring of what was called Nephilim or giants. Yep. And these things had names. Goliath, Anak, Agabeshan, the sons of Anak, comes from... Uh, you know, the Anunnaki comes from, what was his name that created Star Wars? What was his name? Anakin. That's where he got the name. This is known. The, even in the occult world, they know that this happened. Because see, whenever those things died, their, dis, their spirits became disembodied. And as Israel fought these Nephilim, Goliath and Og, physically, literally, it happened. In the Old Testament, you and I fight them today. We do not war, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against world rulers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. When you see yourself not being able to control yourself and it explodes into a fight with someone that you care about, eh, probably not just your flesh. Like, yeah, it's your flesh that you're not able to crucify, but the enemy of your soul is back there chattering and he's over there trying. So you're not in a wrestling match with flesh and blood. So the quicker you and I come to that realization and, and, we, and we say, you know what, you lying devil, <laughs> right. and I'm on to you. I'm on to you and your tricks. Amen. And, and so we need, to, we need to understand these things. But where it talks about those angels leaving that habitation, that word in the Greek is oikaterion. And it means a house. They left their house. So sometimes the word house is utilized to describe a body, but it's also used to describe believers in the letter to the Corinthian church. The same exact word only used twice in the New Testament, oikaterion, where the apostle Paul said, we long not to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly 
Oikaterion, our heavenly house, is how it's translated because you and I are going to receive a glorified body. So I want you to understand that the word house is being utilized on multiple occasions. And sometimes it's talking about the vessel, the human vessel, but also it, the word kingdom is utilized. And Jesus talked about, he talked about the strong man, right? And and I'm not going to ask anybody to come sit up here. But had I had somebody to help me remember to get this prop, I would have just got a string of rope. And I would have had somebody sit in this chair right here. Because Jesus said that you can't spoil a man's goods until you first bind the strong man. And what he was talking about is that Satan is the strong man of this earth. And you need to understand that Jesus recognized that Satan is the prince of this world. He says it three times in the Gospel of John. He's not supposed to be the prince over your life. He's not supposed to be the prince over my life. As a matter of fact, he's not your prince. If you're born again this morning, if you have truly received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he is not your king. Jesus is your king. You just may not have realized that yet. But I hope this morning that you'll have a little bit of a better understanding. So Jesus said, how can you spoil the man's goods out of his house <coughs> if until you first bind the strong man. And so it would be kind of like the illustration of the strong man is in this chair and you just wrap the rope around him. And he said, you're not going anywhere today, buddy. And tie a little half hitch knot in there or some kind of bowling knot or whatever, one that you can't get out. And, and, and he's stuck there and he's bound there. And that, that's what Jesus was saying in the spirit realm. He's got a kingdom. Right, But I have come to bind him so that the spoil can be taken. And the way that he bound him was when he went to the cross and he resurrected because he took away the legal right for Satan yeah. to hold yeah. God's people in bondage. And it's important that you understand that because of sin, because of sin, Satan has had a legal right to hold human beings in bondage. All right. And so so this idea of this house, it, it's almost as though and I believe that this is where John Bunyan, you everybody ever heard of John Bunyan, the Pilgrim's Progress? Y'all ever heard of that book? It was written in 1678. It's the most published Christian fiction ever known. It's an amazing book, really. It's an allegory. The main character's name is Christian. OK. And Christian's on the journey. He's on the journey of life. He's trying to make it to the celestial city. It's like you and I. He's Christian on a journey and he gave his heart to the Lord. But now he's got he's got to go and he's going wander this journey. And he runs into all of these situations that are so reminiscent of your Christian life and my Christian life. There's one spot in the story where Christian and another journeyman along with him. I don't remember his name, but he says, they, man, this is a hard road. This is the path. This is the path. This is the way that's going to lead us to the celestial city. But man, it's. It's getting kind of rocky right here. It's getting kind of hard. Why don't you take a peek over that fence right there and see how it looks? Oh, Christian, it's a beautiful meadow. And if we walk right there on that meadow, we take this shortcut over here. And I'm telling you right now, it's going to be a whole lot better for our feet. But the problem is, is that they were trespassing. And they were found to be trespassing. And whenever they were found to be trespassing, there was a giant named Despair. And and the giant named Despair had people that worked for him. And they went and grabbed Christian and his fellow journeyman, and they locked him up in the giant named Despair's castle. And that's kind of like what Jesus is talking about here in Matthew chapter 12. He's describing a kingdom and a house where the, where the strong man has power to hold people in bondage and slavery. If you could imagine a house or a palace filled with people in rooms and they're chained to the walls and they want to be free. And, and if you were chained to the walls yourself, you would be, you, you see, you, you didn't know that by hopping the fence and walking in the soft meadow that that's how it was going to end up because it never looks like it's a bad place to go when you first start off. It always is enticing and it always looks like it's going to be fulfilling. But the reality is, is that now you find yourself in bondage. And even at first, when you're first in bondage, it's probably kind of bad a little bit to be chained to a wall. But, but it's only going to get worse as long as you're there. And the longer that you're there, 
where despair starts to set in. Then you begin, you begin to become weighted and burdened. And now you just wish that you would have never even looked over that fence. You wish you would have never stepped into that meadow. You wish you would have never tried to find an easier path because now. And you can also start to hear the cries of other people through the walls. And they're crying out and they're saying, I just wish that I didn't. I wish I wouldn't have made that decision. I wish I wouldn't have gone down that pathway. I wish I wouldn't have taken that turn to the left. I wish I wouldn't have taken that turn to the right. And you can hear the cries of the people in giant despair. He's just laughing. He's over there eating his turkey leg or whatever he eats. And he's just laughing because he's got people in bondage in the midst of his, in the midst of his kingdom. And I'm here to tell you the good news is that the Lord has come to bind the strong man, amen. And we, we use this scripture Wednesday night, but let's go ahead and put it up there. Colossians chapter 2, verses uh, 13 through 14. And I'm using the King James Version in this particular scripture because it's really the only one that's right, to be honest with you. We can start at verse 13. And so it says right here, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. Now, I wanted to start there with that word trespasses, because I just talked about trespasses. And I want to tell you that a big part of what I'm trying to talk to you about this morning is how we, you and I, as the people of God, handle the word of God. I'm not talking to unbelievers this morning, because unbelievers most of the time don't even believe that the Bible is even really the word of God. I'm talking to you as a believer, as a born again child of God, if you have indeed received Christ Jesus the Lord, that the word of God has been given to you and has been given to me. And that, the, that we oftentimes, we just... We take it for granted. You read the story of Josiah the king. And you know. I, I talked about it the other day. But it was like. Y'all go do some work on the temple. And they're doing some work on the temple. And they're like. They start moving some stuff around. And they're like. What is this? What is this book right here? This is the book of the law. This is the book that Yahweh gave to his people Israel and it's been tucked away somewhere in the house of God that where people didn't even know it. No wonder there was idolatry in the house of God. No wonder the people of God thought they were worshiping God, but they weren't worshiping God. They were worshiping false gods. They had allowed idols into their lives and they thought that they were perfectly fine. But had they taken the time as the people of God to open the word of God and not to take taken for granted that the preacher was going to tell them the right thing or that or that their you know their favorite youtuber was going to tell them the right thing but that instead they would have opened up the word for themselves Amen. they would have learned what was right what was wrong and they wouldn't have found themselves in such a situation they wouldn't have been trespassing and they wouldn't have been trying to take a different pathway and so he said he took the handwriting of ordinance that was against us. See, they went against, it's talking about the law right there, but they went against the word. Amen. He, he took it out of the way. He nailed it to his cross. But I want you to see this part. He spoiled principality. So while on one hand, the word spoiled does mean that the goods that are taken. On the other hand, right here, it's talking about the fact that the Lord defeated principalities and powers. What it's talking about right here when it says principalities and powers is fallen angels, is demonic spirits, is the works of darkness. Yeah. And, and it says that he spoiled them and he made a show of them openly and he triumphed over them in it. So he didn't only defeat them, but he stripped them. And, uh, he stripped them of their power yeah. and he stripped them of their authority. And in the heavenly realm, he paraded yeah. this situation and all of the spiritual realm knows that Jesus yeah. is victor. All of the spiritual realm knows that he is the king. Yeah. Fallen angels know that at the name of Jesus, yeah. they will bow. Demonic spirits know that at the name yeah. of Jesus, they will bow. But Lord, help his church because after the time we don't know it we don't know it we don't believe it i'm here to tell you that if we come to a place where we start believing the word of god we start seeing some victory in our lives amen the way that we need to see victory amen. that's how he bound the strong man in matthew chapter 12 is what he was doing through the cross whenever he's like i made the illustration tying that rope was him dying 
Look, the Lord gave me this message in a dream. Interesting enough, Thursday night I went to bed. And I said, Lord, give me a dream. Give me a dream. And because you know what? I'm getting interested. I'm getting interested in hearing the Lord speak every way that he desires to speak. Whether it be through dreams, whether it be through visions, whether it be through words of knowledge. I don't want to hear. But you know one of the things I'm noticing about this whole prophetic movement and different things that are happening that are currently happening in, in the world today? Half the time, the reason that we're running into trouble is that because people are so hungry for the prophetic, but they ain't really hungry for the word of God. And there's no balance in their lives. And Lord, help us. Because we got a whole bunch of people running around acting like that and they're not really balanced in the whole of the scripture. They don't understand the basics of what it means to be a new creation in Christ, Lord, because that's what the New Testament is all written about. Uh, and, and, and so anyway, I did, though. I prayed and I said, Lord, give me a dream tonight. And, and, and listen, this has never happened before. Okay. I went to bed with a plan that if I got, had a dream, I was going to be able to be, be diligent and write down. I said this specifically, though. I said, Lord, Give me a dream. I want dreams that help me to understand better what you're already doing in the earth. But Lord, more specifically, I want you to give me a dream about what you want me to preach. And so that's how I got this message. Now, I'd already kind of preached a message like this before, but I want to tell you, this dream was so highly symbolic. And there's other meanings to the dream that I have to move through because it has to do with personal stuff and people that I know. But for the purpose of this message, I just want to kind of share with you a little bit about, and it was so vivid, so symbolic, and I remembered it like I don't ever remember dreams like this. Basically, I was in a truck with some other guys. I don't even know who the guys were, but I know in the dream that they had come out of a house that I was about to go into. They had already done and went and saw this person that I was going to see. And whenever I got out of the house, got out of the vehicle to go see the person, there were people playing basketball. And I don't know who they were, but I know that they were connected to the house that I was at. And I went to the left side and I went and I knocked on the door and there was a young lady that answered the door. Okay, and she's she's significant, but not for not for the purposes of this message, right? And she had a towel of some sort, and I know she wasn't like wrapped around her body. Pretty sure it was like wrapped around her head. The idea was is that she had just taken a shower and she was getting ready, and she was saying, "I got to go somewhere." And she actually said the person's name David, and I don't even really know what that has to do with anything right now. But she said, "Yeah, I'm going to be going somewhere with David. Is that going to be a problem for you?" I'm like, "No, you can do whatever you need to do. I just need to see this person." over here where are they at well they're right over there so it's like i walked through a kitchen area into a living room and the first thing that i noticed to the left on this table was a goblet of wine now i'm not here to preach on alcohol i, I preach on alcohol but that's not what i'm doing this morning but what i will tell you is this is that the goblet versus a glass was significant you're not supposed to drink wine out of a goblet no matter what you believe about drinking wine because the scripture is clear. Okay, that was excess. That was the idea of this big old goblet of wine that there was excess in this situation. And in this situation, there was kind of like, it was like a little bit of a wrestling match. It was kind of like different. Um, and something wasn't really right with the person. Okay, I could see it in their face. Something wasn't right, but they were smiling and the, the emotion wasn't like, it was like, oh, I'm freaked out. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious. I'm, I'm having an anxiety problem. But, but I knew that something wasn't really quite right with the person. And then, then that was it and it was over and I was walking over here to leave and the person that answered the door, weird enough, was actually not two people. Okay, but it was the same, but not two people. It was one person, but I knew that it had two different people that I knew from my past. And she was sitting there and now she was putting makeup on her eyes. And I, and for whatever reason in the dream, I said, all right, I'm leaving. Don't be naughty. And her response was, I've already been naughty. And then I walked out. And when I woke up and I remembered all of these things, two things that stuck out to me was her comment. I've already been naughty. And also this big goblet of wine. And the Lord began to reveal to me. And I mean, he began to download me on the drive from the house over here and in prayer. He began to download to me that these things that were symbolic in the dream, the goblet of wine and the naughty comment, whatever that was. See, these people in this house weren't really going anywhere. She was getting dressed. She was putting on her makeup like her and David were going to go out on a date, but she wasn't really leaving today. The play, people playing basketball outside, they weren't really leaving that yard. They were all acting like everything was normal. 
They were playing their games. They were smiling with weird looks on their face because something wasn't quite right. But they weren't really leaving. See, they were in bondage. And they were stuck in this house. And they really couldn't get free yet. And what the Lord began to show me about the goblin and the naughty comment was that that was the place where the enemy had them. There were things in their lives that were still present that they were pretending weren't there. Things in their lives that were still present that they were pretending weren't there that gave Satan a legal right to hold them in bondage. And they didn't even know that they were actually free and that that's why they were stuck in that spot where they were. You know, Jesus told the Laodiceans in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17 in the King James Version, he said this, because you say I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You see, you see that spot right there when he says, and knowest not. He says, you say that you're rich and increased with goods. Do we have the past the scripture? Uh, oh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Because you say I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not <coughs> that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And that, isn't that something? See, because he's talking to a church. He's talking to a church and he's saying to them, this is what you're saying about yourself. You're saying that you're rich. You're saying that you're increased with goods and that you have need of nothing. But what you don't know about yourself is that really you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, blind, and naked. Yeah. See, that's why it's called deception. Because you can't see it. Just like the people in the house that really thought that they were living a normal life, but they really, really weren't. Just like the people that are caught up in the dungeon over there and they're chained to the walls of Giant Despair's castle and they can't get out. People don't realize that it was deception. When he would look over the wall and he thought that the, the soft meadow was going to be the right way to go. No, it was deception because it looked right. Just like Lot when he looked upon the plain of the Jordan. And he said, look, it's well watered and I'm a herdsman. This is the perfect place for me to move all of my, my, my sheep. And then it says, and he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Big mistake. So many times we as believers are over here making decisions on what seems to look good. Seems to look right to the logical mind. God gave me a brain and he wants me to use it is what we would say. I'm here to tell you right now, if you're a child of God, you better let your own brain and your own mind be subservient to the spirit of God. If you're born again this morning and if you don't know the difference, you better start crying out and asking the Holy Spirit to reveal to you that you would know the difference between your own logic and your own mind and the voice of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Because you see, Abraham made his decisions based on an eternal promise. Mm. I keep, it's so, it's so full in my spirit right now. And even I preached it to like a little group of people last night. We had a little gathering. This belongs, it was for a family that needed, you know what I'm saying? It was, they, they've been, they're stuck in their house. And they asked if we could minister and so, and uh, but where he says right here, he says uh, in John chapter six verse forty, this stuck out to me when I because I preached out of John to him, and this is the will of him that sent me that everyone which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. I cannot get the thought of everlasting life out of my heart, out of my spirit, man. Because I watch all of humanity, the people that I engage on a regular basis and even many Christians, and were so enthralled in the things of the world. While I was worshiping earlier, the Lord reminded me, and I know I've shared this story before about how I went with, pastor, with a pastor to, to in Indianapolis for a preaching conference. And, 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 I, and I've said this before, but this, this teacher 
that we went to go see was known as the greatest, okay, you ready, homiletician of our time. What is a homiletician? It's a person that orates the scripture, like the way he communicates it, it just, it flows out. Nobody talks better than this guy. Nobody takes the concepts and puts them together like that. That's different than exegesis is the study and the breakdown and the division of the word and understanding the heart of God, right? And a good preacher will be able to do a little bit of both, amen? But this guy, he's within the first five minutes, he said, if you have not touched their felt needs in the first 20 minutes, you lost them. Mm -hmm. And it just pierced my heart. And I asked the preacher I was with, I was like, that doesn't bother you? He's like, no, man, I believe that. So basically what he was trying to tell now, what I need you to understand is this, and this is, this is, this is boots on the ground. This is seeing it with my own eyes. I got my master's degree from that Southwestern Assembly Guide University. I got a master's in Bible theology. I endured it. I did it. I got the, I got the certificate, never framed it, never put it on the wall, but I got it. It's at the house somewhere. All right. So I've been there. So what I'm telling you, I, I saw it. They are popping out preachers. For, and that was probably 10 years. That was probably 15 years ago that I got that degree. They've been pumping out preachers like that to convince them that what you need to hear is that what they need to say touches your felt need. What that means is this, is that if you're going through something that I would present the gospel in such a way that it would make you feel better about your situation and give you hope. That it would make you, thank you, sir. He said, tickle your ears. To say it and present it in such a way that you would be able to receive it for yourself and that you would walk out of here feeling better, but not really in the end, not really change. Come on. And now we have had a whole cultural shift in the house of God, in the houses of God and in the kingdom of God to where the preachers present the word of God in such a way that it touches your felt needs for what you're going through today. You got financial situations, we're going to talk to you about that. You got relationship issues, we're going to talk to you about that. You got problems on the job, we're going to talk to you about that. But we're going to make it in a way where it becomes very practical so that you can now take some practical steps that will make your life better now. Uh -oh. Bestseller book right there. Your best life now. But what we're really doing is, is that we're enticing, like he said, tickly ears, and we're enticing the flesh yeah. because the flesh wants to live, but the word of God says the flesh must die. Yes, yes. The gospel says that we must die. And what I'm trying to say is, is that we're over here trying so hard <coughs> to make ourselves successful upon this earth and yes. in this life, and we're forgetting about eternal life. We're forgetting yes. about everlasting life. And you want to know why? Because we don't really believe it. Uh -oh. No, we don't really believe it. Because if we believed it, we'd be getting our heart right before yeah. the Lord. If we really believed that there was eternal life to gain, if we really believed that there was eternal life to lose, if we really believed what the words of our master was saying, yeah. we would be getting along with the Lord. And we'd be saying, I might be stuck in the giant named despair dungeon, but I want to be free. I might have, I peeked over that wall, Lord. Lord, and I walked through the wrong meadow and I was found trespassing against you. But Lord, please get my heart right. Lord, won't you do something in me? Because I'm here to tell you right now, this thing is real, my friend. Everlasting life is real. Eternal life is real. And Jesus paid a high price so that you and I can get it. But you know what we do? Let's listen to me. Some people are going to watch on video. Some people in here. Some people you're going to leave. There's going to be a few people that you're going to walk out and you're going to go right back to where you were. I hate to say it, but it's going to, like, it's going to likely happen. It doesn't have to happen. I don't mean to be a negative confessor. I'm not trying to give you a negative confession. But, 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 but Lord, you've got to do something in the hearts and lives of, of your people. Lord, what is it? What is it going to, you know, I can remember one time. Everything, I don't even know where this is coming from, but I've shared this story before, but when the Lord first got a hold of me in 01, after my sister died tragically, and all of a sudden, see, I used to talk to this dude at the old church I went to, 
And you know what I talk to him about? Oh, yeah, well, let me tell you something. Ryan, you know, Ryan Leaf could throw a ball, you know, blah, blah, blah. And this dude here, he could, his vertical leap was da, da, da. His 40 time, that wide receiver's 40 time was 4.39 at the combine. I sit here and list off all this garbage information about football. I like football. Okay, I'm just trying to make a point. Everything was real cool while I was talking about how high a running back can jump. But boy, let me tell you, and this was a church dude. When I started talking about Jesus like that, when I started talking about the word of God like that, after the Lord came up in that bar room, I was like, a, I was a prisoner in a dungeon. I was hopeless and helpless. And the Holy Spirit showed up and he spoke to me. And after he pulled me out of that, and I started now, I wanted to talk about Jesus yeah. and how he comes oh. to set the captive free. And I want to start talking about kingdom yeah. stuff and, and the word of God. Yeah. He's like rolling his eyes and he's like, what's this? all about. <laughs> What's this all about? I'll tell you. He said, I'm concerned you're getting so heavenly minded, you're not any earthly good. <laughs> Come on, somebody. We, we, we know, you know what the problem is? We're so earthly minded, we're no heavenly good. <laughs> That's really the problem. And, and, and amen. And, and, and the world and the church is trying to convince us it's a flip-flop. That's right. No, it's not. Because let me say right. something. If you would allow your flesh to die, and you would allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in you, I'm in trusting in the midst of the trials of life and hold on to him, yes. he'll promote you. The word of God says that promotion comes from the Lord. Amen. What I'm talking about is you ain't got to rub shoulders with the boss, man. You ain't, you know, I don't know if that's a good word to use. You don't have to suck up to the boss, man. You don't have to, no, then you don't purposely act like a rebel towards the boss, man, just to make a point, because I've done that too. But but you do what's right according to the yes. word of the Lord. You show up to work. You work harder than everybody else. You give an honest day's work for an honest day's wage, and you live your life for the Lord and you allow the Holy Spirit to deal with you and you learn how to get to along together with people on the job because it's going to mess up your testimony if you don't and you learn to live your life God will promote you God will take care of you instead of you trying to be like Jacob running around and trying to make stuff happen for yes, yourself yes. this isn't even in the message but somebody needs to hear it because it's our flesh and it's our own desires to try to accomplish upon the earth according to our own ways. And I'm here to tell you that the Lord wants to do away with us yes. so that Christ, because if we would let Christ have his way in us, I'm telling you right now, I've seen it happen in my life, so don't tell me it's impossible. I've seen God promote me and do things in my life. And I ain't been perfect, my friend, but I have seen it happen time and again in my life, where he showed up and he did really the impossible. Yeah. So I just want to encourage you to know this. So he said, look, you say you're rich and increased, but you have need of nothing, but you don't even know it. You don't even know you've been deceived <laughs> where you are. See, the people in the dream were trapped. The lay in the sea and thought that they were okay. But I want you to know something. You know, I was told, I should have warned you. I was told you know the lyrics to this song, Narnia. <laughs> you know, this is a new thing. I love this. Do you feel the sun sets free? It's free indeed. No more chains of slavery. Yes. Truth has triumphed yeah. in victory. And who the sun sets free is free indeed. You don't know the words. Well, who the sun sets free <laughs> is free indeed. Please don't let Brother Swagger hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Who the sun set free is yes, free indeed. Yes. I want you to know that you're free. Yes. yes. Amen. I want you to experience freedom. See, previously, you might not even know you were in bondage. <laughs> I was talking to, I think it was John the other day. I was like, man, look, until I was free, I didn't even realize I was in bondage. Yes. No, seriously. You think it's normal. Like the people in that house. Old girl thought, hell, this is normal life. Basketball players thought this is normal, but there wasn't nothing normal about it. They were stuck. 
And I'm here to tell you that when the Lord starts to free you and rescue you from the bondages that you've been enslaved to for many, many, many years, you start realizing, oh my goodness, yes. I was in bondage, but now I was once a slave, but now I'm free. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The love and mercy of God is so beyond our understanding. <laughs> and I know you know this, but one day grace is going to end. And when grace ends, let me just say this. You don't want to be stuck in uncertainty in that, in that house. Mm -hmm. you, you, listen to me. If you're living in that house and you're not really free to, 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 to do what the Lord has taught you, you don't want that end of grace to happen and you're stuck in that house. What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm not trying to say anything other than you don't want to be stuck. In that house, when the Lord comes back for His people, when that when stuff starts to, to go down, and 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 and, and life ain't, ain't ain't as easy as what you want to you want to get out, you want to get out of the trap now. And then it, now is the time to to get out of the trap. So Jesus did His part when He died, and and He rose from the dead. And, but the question is, did we do our part? And I've been really trying to explain this the best way I know how. And I feel like I lack words to properly try to, 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 to ex explain this concept about true repentance. You see, the Bible, she said in the song, it said, we are a voice in the wilderness crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. John the Baptist was a voice in the wilderness under the power of the spirit of Elijah crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. I can't remember the name of the message, but I preached it a little over a year ago where the Lord said, this is the battle cry from now till the end that a people called by his name would have a ministry like John the Baptist. And with the voice of John the Baptist and with the spirit of Elijah who combated Jezebel, a untoward spirit that's over the church would have the battle cry and would proclaim to those that are that they work with, that those that they that they're in families with, prepare you the way of the Lord right. for the King is returning. I'm here to tell you the King is returning. I'm here to tell you that the battle cry for God's people is the message: repent, repent, and to get our hearts right. And so when I say repentance, <coughs> what does that look like? I mean, whenever I said the word goblet of wine and when I said that that girl said, I've already been naughty, something might have entered into your mind. It's a good chance that something could have entered into your mind and you could have thought to yourself, that's my goblet, that's my naughty. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, is what does even true repentance look like? Well, I, I, until you've been in there, it's kind of hard to describe. But can I tell you this? It's not. A, I'm not talking about just feeling sorry about something. That's right. It, it, instead, it's that your heart broken over. Yeah. Yeah, and only the Holy Spirit can get you to that place. Yeah. So I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm not trying to make you feel weird. Only the Holy Spirit can get you. But it has to start to some extent with you wanting the God's will for your heart and for your life to get you right. And so you have to start, instead of escaping and acting like you're not trapped, you have to start speaking to God from your heart and saying, Lord, I want to be free. Lord, I want to come to a place of true repentance. And sometimes for me personally, this is what I've learned. When I started repenting, it just kept going and going. And the more he revealed, the more I repented of. And the more I repented of the closer I, be, I came to him and the closer I came to him, the more I was convicted of and the more I became convicted of, the more I repented of and then yet I got closer and closer and more intimate and felt his presence and was overwhelmed with his love and was overwhelmed with his goodness. Yes. You see what I'm saying? It's a different kind of love than what a lot of preachers 
are talking about. They're just, they just want to make everybody feel good and give a little patty cake and grab hands and sing Kumbaya. But I'm here to tell you that's not how it's working in the, in the economy of God. If you read them, if you have read the Bible, I'm not asking you to raise your hand if you've ever read the whole Bible. But I'm here to tell you, if you've been serving the Lord for 10 years, Lord, help us to get our eyes on your scripture. Quit taking my word for what I'm telling you. Open up the book and start reading it for yourself. Amen. And let the Lord speak to you. Quit listening to other preachers. Open up the word of God and let the word of God through the Holy Spirit speak to you. Get you alone. Yeah. Hallelujah. And have his way with your heart. Yeah. Amen. And if you, if you want him to do it, he'll do That's it. Right. Yeah. See, I was thinking about this. It probably wouldn't be that big of a deal. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe so. But if someone that you really didn't care that much about cheated on you, you know, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, well, I don't know when that person will leave anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just save me the, save me the trouble. <laughs> you know? But God help you if the love of your life cheats on you. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, I'm just trying to break it down into human emotion talk, right? And have you ever felt like you were head over heels in love with somebody and they just dropped you like a hot potato, you know? And it's like, but I thought we had something real going on here, you know? Oh my gosh, my heart's broken. And it's just like, you just stepped all over my heart. That's that's painful. Yeah, that would be That would be painful, right? I mean, I don't know that I've ever had exactly that happen to me, but I can only imagine because you see what I'm trying to say is, is that the more intimate I get with the Lord, the more I realize how many times I've done that to him. Yes, yes. And, and listen, if we think that it's going to just be an okay, something like I'm a sorry Lord out of the side of our mouth after knowing that the Lord made Hosea the prophet marry Gomer. Just so that the prophet would feel the broken heart of God. And he'd have it written in the scripture for you and I to know that God's heart is broken. Yes. yes. Whenever his people cheat on him like that. Mm -hmm. Lord help us. Yeah. God must how, how God must feel when we lie, cheat, steal, are covetous, or we maintain our pride and our arrogance when we engage in immorality. How does this make God feel? You know, listen, we ought to all be feeling a little something right now because I'm here to tell you right now, if you dare read this book right here, what you're going to learn is, is that there's seven things God hates and one of them is a liar. That's right. Come on. He wrote it, my friend. Liars, fornicators, the effeminate, it, it's in here. And they ain't nobody going to stand before it on that day and plead ignorant. <laughs> you ain't pleading ignorant. I ain't pleading ignorant. It's here. They rejected this word. But he made it available for you and I. Now listen, I ain't trying to talk, preach no works-based message. You can't do it in your own strength. But I'm here to tell you that when we see the word of God and what it says, and we let it pierce our heart, and when we get along with the Lord and we say, Lord, have your way with me. We got to come clean with the Lord. You know, I've known some people that ain't never. Listen, I'm probably a guy that says I'm sorry too much because you can overdo saying you're sorry, right? I heard somebody tell me one time, okay, that's the fifth time when you're going to change. Oh, that's good. Because true repentance means to change direction and to yeah. change your mind. But you know what? I've seen some people do. They can't say they're sorry. They can't do it, dude. It's almost like Arthur Fonzarelli in Happy Days. I'm sorry. <laughs> they can't do it. Like, what's wrong with you? Do you have a frog in your throat? Can you not say those words? Can you not humble yourself to another human being when you know that you had fault in the situation? Yeah. Try it. If you just would do it, just let it come out. I'm sorry. Yeah. Ooh. You might feel some freedom. You might feel something lift off in your back. Oh, no, no, no. I can't be wrong. I can't. No, you're wrong. Pretty much every day of your life, you're wrong. You're 
doing something wrong. I'm doing something wrong. Oh, Lord, help us. I, Lord, you get the point I'm trying to make. I'm not trying to beat you down. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. That if you would line up with the Lord and his will for your life, let your flesh move out of the way. Hallelujah. He's going to start working on your heart. He's going to start putting the cross on your flesh. He's going to start producing fruit in your life. He's going to start... You don't, you don't even believe. Do you believe this morning that God can do great and wonderful things in your heart? Yes, yes. Do you believe for one second that God can do miracles in your life? Yes. Do you believe that he can give you more than you ever? And that's another thing. Oh, now we're here. We're going to preach in prosperity. I'm just telling you right now, I ain't looking for prosperity. But the Lord has shown up prospered me. That's right. I'm telling you right now, he is a God that loves to give. He is a God that loves to bless. The question is, are we going to live for him? Every time I lost something, it was because I was doing something wrong. Amen. Or he was trying to teach me mm-hmm. something. And then it's to hold on. Hold on. And to go through it. Amen. So that's what we're talking about. How this must make God feel. How broken hearted he must be when we treat his word like it's a common thing. You know? Like maybe he really didn't mean it. I hate it really. I mean, when, when Jesus said that, if you lust out the woman in your heart, you've already committed it, don't you? He couldn't admit that. No, he meant it. <laughs> but, but if he said it and he meant it, then that means you can be free in that area. Yes. That means you can actually be free in your heart. Yes. That means you can actually be free in your mind. Yes. Amen. And how does that happen? It's because he already went to the cross and the Holy Spirit will slay that thing in you. Yes. If you'll let him. If you'll surrender, then you'll let him. He can do things for you in the Spirit. That you wouldn't even you, you wouldn't even imagine That's the right. victory that he could give to Amen. you. I want you to know that. Amen. The thought that committing sin pleases our flesh daily gets the preeminence over Jesus. And the question is, have we repented? You know, Jesus quoted Isaiah in Isaiah 29 and verse 13. I think that this is important right here. It says, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth. And with their lips, they do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me. But look at this part. And their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Boy, I tell you, last night when I was laying, the Lord dropped this verse in my my spirit. And when I saw that part there, because Jesus didn't quote it exactly like that. When I saw that, they, they talk with their mouth, they honor me with their lips, but they've removed their heart. And look at that. And their fear toward me is taught by the precepts of men. The thoughts of men, the teachings of men, the doctrines of men have taught God's people how they perceive they should fear him. Yeah. So, so we turn on any kind of preacher today and we're like, they, they don't even talk about the fear of the Lord. But where's the awe of God? Where's yes, the fear yes. of God? Where's reverence for the presence of the Holy Spirit? Do we even really think that the Lord's going to show up in the midst of a service? Or are we just kind of half-hearted showing up in here? Do we really believe that wherever we go that the Lord is with us, that he's living in us, that the things that we put our eyes upon, that we're also bringing the Lord in there? Do we really <coughs> believe this? And then whenever it gets to Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 and it says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I used to never even quote the last part of the verse. I used to say, work out your own salvation. Most of the time, you know what we're doing? We're trying to use it to flip-flop on somebody. You don't judge me. Oh, hold on. Don't judge me. You can't judge me, preacher. Okay? No, I'm not the judge. Jesus, that's why I'm over here trying to be all passionate to try to convict you. Because one day, he's gonna, you're gonna, we're going to be judged. We're either going to be judged in Christ or outside of Christ. And we're going to give an account for every idle word. And we're going to give an account for the reward. So if we make it in, hallelujah. But whatever we get for the Lord is going to be judged on that on, on that outside. But I used to always just say, you know, work out your own salvation. That's what people do. Just work out your own salvation, man. Come on, man. Back off, dude. Right? Back off, bro. Like, I'm working out mine. You work out yours. No. Work it out. And from now on, when they say, I'm going to say, with fear and trembling, brother, 
sister, yes. with fear and trembling, yes. fear and trembling yes. uh, for the presence of God. This one will I take note of, the Lord says. He, he of a contrite heart and trembles at my word. You want the Lord to take notice of you? Do you? Is there anybody in this place that wants the Lord to take notice of them? That wants the Lord to move in their heart? That wants the Lord to do something in their life? Then you need to start trembling at his word. Yes. You need to learn his word and you need to quit treating it like it's just some common thing and that you can hide it under a shelf somewhere and let it collect dust and act like it's not there. No. You need to get into the word and you need to, when you read it, you need to believe this is the word of the living God and by the grace of God he's going to start producing this truth in my heart and in my life so Jesus did his business amen yeah. Jesus did his work it's a finished work that's what the word of God says and I believe that the question is have we done a proper business transaction with the Lord earlier in, in Revelation chapter 3 verse 17 he said you say that you're rich and increased and you don't even know that you're blind and you're naked and so so what I want you to see is in Revelation 3 18 he's, this is what Jesus says counsel of I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich white raiment that you might be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear that you would anoint your eyes with eyes set that you might see and that word buy literally means to do business. The Lord wants to do business. Just like he said in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they can be made white like wool. He wants to do business with you. And his part's been done. And what he wants you to do is to repent of whatever it is. What is your goblet, Christian, if you have one? What is your goblet? What is your naughty comment? And, and, and listen, he wants us to come clean with him. You ain't got to come confess your sin to the preacher. As a matter of fact, don't. But get it alone. Get alone with the Lord. And don't just be like Britney Spears. Oops, I did it again. Let your heart be poured out before the Lord. Cry. Even if, it, even if you don't feel emotion towards it at first, at least say it. Lord, I'm sorry. Try to say that to the Lord if you can't say it to a human being. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the words that sometimes I speak out of my mouth. I'm sorry how I misrepresent you on the job site. I'm sorry for how I lied, I cheated, I stole. I'm sorry, Lord, for all of the things that I did, for the ways that I treated women wrong, for the ways that I treated men wrong. I'm sorry, Lord, that I cheated. Lord, I, I realize now that it wasn't just all them that I've been blaming everything on but that I too have sinned against yes. you Lord. that I too have been wrong you, 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 we all of us in this place got something that we need to get right with the Lord yes. Yes. come on yes. help me out here yes. I'm, not, I'm not against you I'm on your team I'm trying to tell you that we all fall, have fallen we all fall short present tense there's things you're missing the target on that you didn't even know was against the will of God. But if you get in that book, you're going to learn. Amen? Amen. He wants to do business. And let me just say this real quick. Somebody watching on video. If you are truly laid it at his feet, then I need you to know something. He has thrown it into the sea of forgiveness. Hallelujah. Again. He has thrown it as far, I don't know which direction is which, as far as the east is from the west. <laughs> he ain't remembering it no more. If you have truly repented and you've done business with God, and that can only be between you and him, I'm not the person to sit here and tell you whether or not you truly repented or not. But I'm going to tell you that when you truly repent, he throws it from as far as the east is from the west. He ain't trying to bring it up. So if somebody's bringing it up, it's the enemy. Now that doesn't mean that when you get along. See, one of the things that I've noticed is, is that the closer I get with the Lord, the more intimate my prayer time becomes with Him. Amen. Sometimes I'll walk in and I'll just say thank you and then the Holy Spirit will overwhelm me. And then sometimes I'll remember things that I've done wrong. And I'll just weep and weep and weep. But I don't feel condemnation. I'm just like, how do you love me like this? Yeah. <laughs> how? Yeah, just... How do you love me like this? I feel nothing but the presence of the Lord all over me and His goodness and His grace overwhelming me and making me fall in love with Him even more. Yeah, yeah. I'm just like, Lord, I, this is 
unbelievable. How could you love a wretch like me? But yet you do. And the more, and then it just feel like, oh, I wish I, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Yes. All right. I don't want to close too fast. Give me a little bit of time. I'm, I'm not going to keep you long, too, too much long. Because this is part of the message. So as I was praying for this message after I came over here and with the dream and all that stuff, and I was praying and the Lord revealed to me, he wanted me to preach out of Matthew chapter 12. He reminded me of Ezekiel in chapter 8. How in chapter 8 of Ezekiel, the Lord goes and grabs Ezekiel by a lock of the hair. Y'all remember that? And it's a vision. He brings him. He says, all right, come with me, son of man. We're going to Jerusalem. And he, and he brings him to the temple. And he says, look at that. He faces him towards the north gate. He says, look at that over there, son of man. Look what they do to me. And he shows him this image of jealousy. That's what it's called in the Bible. It says, he showed me the image of jealousy. And I'm just trying to say, connected to the dream, that was the goblet, that was the naughty comment. Whatever the image of jealousy is, that's in the life of, it's, it's an idol that's standing in the way of the presence of God. It's an idol that's in the presence of God, and it's an ongoing per continuation of sin that God is not okay with. Okay? And he says, look what they do to me, son of man. They're trying to make me leave my house. <laughs> the Lord's saying, I don't want to leave. There, that's the one spot in the Bible that I can definitely tell you that it says, and it's the name, connected to the name Ichabod, but the glory of the Lord has left the temple. It's in the book of Ezekiel. Because at some point in time, his presence will leave. It's not easy to make him leave. I'm going to tell you that right now. You need to know that. He ain't trying to leave you, my friend. He's trying to stay. He's trying to grab a hold. He's trying to get you where he wants you because he, he loves you. But he sees this image of jealousy. He says, look what they look. Then it gets even worse. He says, come with me, son of man. And he brings him to a hole in the wall. And he says, look at this. He says, go ahead and open up that hole. So it's almost like there's a hole in the wall. They brought him into the, where the rooms of the temple are. And he says, open up that hole. He says, so I open up the hole. And he said, now come in here. And so he comes in there, and it's almost like, actually, you can go, you can go to Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 12. He, he goes in there, and it's like he shows them that it's like there's rooms. And some of y'all remember I've talked about this before. There's rooms. And look what it says. And, and, and this is probably the King James, I guess. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do? So he's talking about his people. In the dark, every man... In the chambers of his imagery. For they say the Lord sees us not. The Lord has forsaken the earth. I'm going to read it out of a different translation. Then the Lord said to me son of man. Have you seen what the leaders of Israel are doing with their idols in dark rooms? They are saying the Lord doesn't see us. He has deserted our land. See the longer you walk in sin and the more comfortable you become with sin the further away the presence of God is and you think that he left but I'm here to tell you that he still sees what's going on and the idea is is that people are in these rooms these various chambers in the dark and each one of them has their own idols and they're in there playing around with their idols and it's the people of God and they're playing around with the things of the world and it's having its effect on their life. And they're like the people in the house. They're locked up in there. They really, really can't get out. And as I was praying and as the Lord was speaking this to me, I just want you to know that all of a sudden I got a little vision in my mind. And it was I knew it was Jesus' hands. And he was holding a ring of large prison keys. You ever seen like in them old movies, a ring with a bunch of, all them prison keys. And all of a sudden, it was like, it was like if this was each room, he started walking up to each one of them. And he started unlocking doors. And he started saying, tell my people that they're free. Tell them that the, lock, that the doors have been unlocked. And that they can now leave the house. And that they can walk out. I want you to know, singers, musicians, y'all can come up, amen. But I need you to know something this morning. The Lord has a word, and He wants His church to be prepared, Amen, for the for what we're what we're facing now, and it's only going to get worse. I'm telling you right now. I was talking to you know somebody yesterday and about this whole LGBTQ thing. I'm like, listen, within five years they're gonna probably want to put me in jail. 
I'm telling you right now, they are already trying to make it to where it's an offense of the God to, to preach the truth of the gospel. They're trying to come again, and they are trying to pour out on us. Listen, this nation, I was watching a video of a Marine talking about it the other day. This nation has put together a group of people to be ambassadors to the nation of India to try to get them to embrace the LGBTQ community. We're not sending Navy SEALs somewhere to rescue people that are bound up. No, we're sending people over there to spread this vile doctrine of our own government. Let me tell you something, Christian. If you enjoy your life, you better, we better learn how to start crying out to God or we won't blame God when everything does fall apart. <laughs> I don't know about you, but it's time for us to start praying. Hey, you know what? It would be one thing if they were allowing people to live how they wanted to live, but now they're telling us that we can't live how we want to live. If you can't see the spirit of Antichrist on that, my friend, you, we better decide whose side we're on. We better decide whose side we're on. Amen? Oh, Lord, help us. Father, in the name of Jesus. Listen, maybe you're here this morning. And I'm about to turn around and I'm about to face the Lord. Face the Lord. <laughs> I'm about to worship the Lord. But maybe you're here this morning and something that was said would say, yeah, you're right, preacher. Right? There's, there's been something that I really need to give to the Lord. You know, there's not a better time or place for it to start right here, right now. And so what I'm going to ask you to do as they start to play is that if that's you, and you know if the Lord spoke to you, I'm going to get you, I'm going to ask you to stand up. Now, nobody's even going to know that you're standing up for that. I mean, I, I don't ask you to make it that easy. I really shouldn't make it that easy. I should make it harder, but I'm just going to say, if that spoke to you, I want you to stand up and I want you to worship the Lord. And if the Lord would lead you, come to the front. We're going to worship the Lord together. But I'm telling you right now, the Lord spoke something to you right now all across this room. You need to stand up. You need to stand up and you need to be counted because you need to let the Lord know it's an act of faith. And you're saying, Lord, there's been something in my heart and in my life. And it's been against you. Thank you, brother. It's been against you, Lord. But I'm ready to stand up. And I'm ready to let you have your way in my heart and my life. And this is the way that it starts. This is the way that it starts. I acknowledge it, Lord. I acknowledge it that I've been against you. And I'm asking you to have your way, Lord. I'm yielding it to you, Lord. I'm yielding it to you. Let's watch this, Lord.